Well, good morning. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here at Walden Community Church, and we are finishing up our series on living a life that matters. So I got a question for you. Do you believe that our righteous acts can change someone's life? Ours, our acts. I mean, true, we might not be able to change the world, but do we have the power to change someone's life? I think we do, especially if we are brave enough to care. And perhaps we should be asking how to begin. How do we begin? We're closing out this series, and I want to end this series by saying, start. <laughs> start. Start right now. Start right now where you are in your own way. Be brave enough to care. Do you ever fantasize about being brave? I do, or at least I did. I remember climbing on the roof of my boyhood home when I was a kid, pretending to be Spider-Man. And if you had asked me when I was a kid what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have told you that I either wanted to be a superhero or James Bond. <laughs> As a kid, all of my heroes were very brave people. They were the Lone Ranger, Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, and Zorro. But Spider-Man, most of all, because he was a dorky teenager who loved science. He wore glasses. He was a kid who got picked on by bullies. But when he was Spider-Man, he was funny and he was brave. And that's who I wanted to be. Have you ever fantasized about being brave? Stepping up, doing the right thing under pressure, saying or doing the right thing at the exact right moment when it was needed? What do you think? Do you think if the opportunity presented itself, could you be brave? I mean, if you saw something that wasn't right, if you saw an abusive situation, saw a burning building or a car accident or a potential threat, would you step in? Would you step up? Would you get involved? I don't know. I think back in the 1940s or 50s, maybe. But with every passing generation, I think we get more and more timid. I think we get more and more filled with self-doubt. We've all become a little bit more fearful and unsure of ourselves. Lately, my wife and I have been talking about this phenomena called imposter syndrome. Do you know what that is? Imposter syndrome is defined as doubting your abilities. You feel like a fraud. It's this very real, very specific uh, form of intellectual self-doubting. Imposter feelings are generally accompanied by anxiety and even depression. Imposter syndrome is a pattern. It's self-doubt. It leads to anxiety. It leads to stress. It leads to missed opportunities. Because you know you can do it, right? You know you can do it. You're perfectly capable of doing it. You probably are even good at it. But you don't do it because you feel like you're not ready or that you might not be good enough. And as a society, we are becoming more inward focused and less apt to take a risk because we are less brave. In 2017, as a state, we all lived through Hurricane Harvey and after the rain uh, stopped, a lot of Texans stepped up and helped. And we all noticed how brave those people were, we even called them local heroes. But were they heroes? I mean, none of them got in a car chase, none of them got in a gunfight, none of them recovered the secret plans, none of them saved the princess. True, but we still call them heroes. Because why? Because they didn't stop and ask, what should I do? Instead, they got to work on what they could do. They gave their heart, they gave their spirit. I was never a good student. In fact, I'm incredibly bad at math. When I stared at my homework, I would eventually become so overwhelmed that I would panic and I wouldn't even begin. And to calm myself down, my father always told me to start on the problems that I knew. Start 
with what you know. We're in this series now for seven weeks, and I could ask you, well, what did we learn? What was the takeaway? What, how are we going to live a life that matters? How are we going to make a difference? How are we going to be a church? I mean, those are all good questions, and those are all good things, and we should ultimately want those things, but how do we start? I would just repeat, start right now where you are in your own way. We've been reading the book of Philippians together, and I guess the assumption would be that we'd focus our time together with the end of the book, but I want to go back to the beginning. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul is our author, and as he writes this, he's in jail, and he begins by telling this church, I am thinking of you. Every time I think of you, he says, I have joy. He says in verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I told you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul says that he has this little church in his heart. And when he thinks of this church, he has joy. Why did Paul love these people so much? He tells us, because of their partnership in the gospel. Church is a partnership not just between you and me, but between each other. This is where we all work. This is where we all chip in. This is where we all put our best foot forward. This is where we all help. The early church that Paul is writing to, they are partners with Paul. And he says, we're all doing this together. In other words, it's, just, it's not just the paid staff who does all the work. The church was where we were coming together after we had been out in the world all week passionately spreading the gospel. Each one was doing what they could in their own way. They were all doing their part. This church didn't stop and ask, well, what should I do? Instead, they got to work on what they could do, giving their heart, giving their spirit. Matthew 28 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Mark 16 says, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Luke 14 says, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel come people to come in, that my house may be filled. Daniel says, and those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The book of Psalms says, he who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Proverbs says, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. What do all these verses have in common? They all speak of winning the lost to Jesus. Church, Paul's prayer for this church in Philippi is my prayer for you. He says in verse 8, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That was Paul's prayer for this little house church 
that resided in Philippi, a small house church that was deep in the heart of a Roman city. And it's my prayer for you, for us, partners in the gospel. It's our job as Christians to be brave and to tell the story of Jesus Christ. It would do us good to listen and obey these words because every believer has the privilege, has the responsibility of sharing the gospel. But just like me with my math homework, the whole thing can feel overwhelming, discouraging, and even frightening at times, and we don't know how to begin. So that first step, start right now. How does one do that? How does one start? And why can't I seem to start? When I, you know, when I get up to go run in the morning, the hardest part of running in the morning at 5.45 a.m., it's not the running. The running is not the hardest part. The hardest part of exercise is getting out of bed. So start right now. Start right now. What's stopping you? Well, maybe we're afraid of what others might think, what others might say. You know, a lot of people don't share their faith or talk to their friends about God from embarrassment or fear. We, we have worries about what other people might think. But what I found is the best way to conquer that fear is to replace that fear with a reverence for God. What did the disciples do when they were told not to preach in the name of Jesus any longer? Acts 5 says, someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in his name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Peter's answer is the correct one. True, many of us are afraid to talk to others about God, but I need to be more worried about disobeying God, letting God down. Th this is my responsibility. A and in the end, it's God that I answer to, not people. In fact, when they evangelize, look at how the early church begins their prayer in Acts 4. It says, when the disciples were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God saying, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, do whatever your hand and your plan has predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with what? All boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak with the word of God with boldness. They had just got out of jail, and now they're heading right back out there. This book is never going to tell you to play it safe. This book is never going to tell you to just mix in and lay low and keep your head down. This book is never going to tell you to just go with the flow. What did they pray for? Boldness. That's the first step to start right now. Pray for boldness. Pray for courage. Because our righteous acts will create immeasurable ripples in the endless river of salvation. Our righteous acts can change someone's life. Perhaps another reason to start right now that people don't take is because they don't feel prepared. I can say start right now, be prepared. Peter later goes on to write in his own letter, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you'll be blessed, have no fear of them nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Peter says, always be ready, always be ready, always be prepared 
to give your testimony. And he says, have a good attitude about it. I think we're nervous for it because we're not ready for it. If I have not studied for the test, I am nervous about how I'm gonna do. But you know, most of you have been studying for this your entire life. Nobody is asking you to be a theologian or to explain the meaning of life. Just share your own story. It's a process, right? Start right now. Start where you are in your own way. You don't have to do it like everybody else. You don't have to present the good news perfectly, nor do you have to know the answer to every question, but you should already know the basic gospel message and just combine it with your own experiences. Share your experience in your own way. You probably even know a handful of Bible verses that you enjoy or that you draw inspiration from or that are important to you, just share those and just explain why those verses speak to you. Or take a moment to find some of those verses that do inspire you and memorize them. You don't even have to memorize them. Write them down on paper, put them in your wallet. Nobody's gonna begrudge you if you remove some verses from your pocket and you say, you know, I carry these around with me because they're important or because they inspire me or memorize them, right? Okay, it, that's fine, memorize verses about salvation so that when the opportunity arises, you always have some Bible available. You know, the three that we use in church, memorize those, memorize the ABCs, admit that you're a sinner. Romans three says all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. What's the second step? Believe, right? Believe in Jesus. Acts 4 says there is no salvation by anyone else, for there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. And then third, confess Christ as your Savior. Romans 10 says if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'm sure you've heard me preach those three verses so often, you've already committed them to memory. And then just walk that person through a short prayer. Other things you could do to build your confidence, feel more brave, uh, take an evangelism course, study your own Bible, go through a discipleship class. It shouldn't be scary to tell someone about God or what God means to you. Tell people how God makes you feel and how God has got you through some of those moments in life. Start right now. Start where you are in your own way. And what does where you are even mean? Well, it means you don't need to go very far. You don't need to get in a plane or, to this, or you need to travel off to some far off land. Wherever God has placed you, that is your mission field. Your hairdresser, your postman, your neighbor, your barber, your butcher, your family, your neighborhood, your club. Volunteer. Say, I would like to pray before our meetings. Be bold. Start letting people know that you're a Christian. Ask people, where do you go to church? Ask people about their beliefs. I know it feels weird. I know you've been told to mind your own business, but minding your own business means that you don't care. If we care about them, we need to start where you are and demonstrate unconditional love for others. First Thessalonians says, so being affectionately desirous of you, we are ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. You know, the Message Bible says that exact verse like this. We were never patronizing, never condescending, but we cared for you the way a mother cares for her children. We loved you dearly. Not content to just pass on the message, we wanted to give you our hearts, and we did. Church, our calling is to be loving. We love God and we love others. And this is so, so important. Please hear me. Do, do you know why we need to try just extra hard right here? Do you know why we need to be very 
diligent in this right here because at one time or another, every single church will be accused of being cliquish. Every church will be accused of being elitist. Every church will be accused of being exclusive or judgmental or hypocritical. The world outside wants to desperately tear you down. And so when that happens, we need to be known as people who love so much, forgive so much, embrace so much that those outside accusations just roll off. Inspired by John 13, 34, the Catholic priest, Friar Peter Skoltes, in the 1960s, wrote the song, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. All this year, I've been saying, we want to be the church where you live. But that's on us, too. We need to be the church where they live. The only reputation our church or any church should ever have is loving. I, I mean, I'll take Bible church, I'll take community church, I'll take friendly church any day of the week, but loving should come first. First Timothy says, The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Every church in America is down in attendance right now. And after the pandemic clears, which church are they gonna seek out? Which church are they gonna return to? The church that looks the most like Jesus. Jesus was loving. His church should be loving. Start where you are, but also don't expect instant results. You know, another thing that can discourage us is how long this all takes, if it ever takes. Some of you have been praying for family members or spouses for years. Paul writes in 2 Timothy, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our God, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Do you think that for Peter or Paul, they just walked around and brought new people to Jesus by the thousands every single day? No, it didn't work like that. For every one day that Paul preached, he spent equal weeks in jail. Evangelism takes time. Love takes time. In another part of the Bible, Paul compared it to gardening. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Your pastors, your church leaders, your authors, your worship bands, those stars and heroes, right? They are not the only ones who take part in this story. It's not just paid staff workers who do all the heavy lifting. Remember, it's all of us partnering together. Every member is a minister. So we're all just gardening. You do your part, I do my part together, and it's a partnership. Church is a partnership. Not just between you and me, but between each other. This is where we all work. This is where we all chip in. This is where we all put our best foot forward. This is where we all help. This early church that Paul is writing to, he says they're partners, and Paul says, hey, we're doing this together. This church is people passionately spreading the gospel all week, each one working their own way, how they should, doing their part in the community. So let's stop asking, what should I do? And let's start getting to work on what we can do. When you help just one person feel more secure, feel more at ease, feel more accepted, 
then the community becomes more secure, more at ease, more accepted. You don't have to wait for someone to tell you to do this. You can give your hearts. You can give your love right now, and you can be the church where we live. One group of people in a community going out and asking others, are you okay? Letting people know that we are here for you. That's where we start. Showing them how much we care and being brave enough to begin. We can be brave and we can start right now where we live in our own way. Be the church. Be the church where you live. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are your church. We are your community, both in this state and across the nation and in the world. We are your bride. And so as a church, as a collective, we await the people who have still not yet returned. And we eagerly await those who've never been. May the church doors always be open. May we always have a smile on our face and a hand extended. May we be the most welcoming, most accepting, most embracing, most forgiving, most grace-filled, most loving place to anyone who comes across our doors. May we extend the hand of fellowship. May we hug like Jesus. And may we tell the world the message that they so desperately need to hear. The blood of Christ forgives. The grace of Christ covers. Eternal life is offered. And our God is King. Give each one boldness to continue this work that this early church in Philippi began, to go out into a world that preaches one thing and to boldly preach another. We ask all of this in your son's precious name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for watching this series and just taking part in these few weeks. Summer is coming next week. We're gonna start our summer series. We're so excited about that. The kids are coming back home. Uh, it's gonna be fun. I hear people are going out, they're going on vacations, they're going camping. Life is returning to normal. We are returning to normal here at Walden Church as well. We've got two services every Sunday. 9.30, we have our traditional service with our choir. And 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service with our worship band. At 11 o'clock, we also have nursery and childcare and youth group. And we're open, we're back to normal, just like what you remember. We got coffee and donuts in between our services. We've got coffee and donuts after our second service. We love you, we miss you terribly. We want you to come back. We wanna be able to see you once again and shake your hand and give you a hug. And don't forget that this video is out there. It's on the internet, it's on YouTube, or you're listening to us on uh, MP3. Don't forget that you can always clip and copy the URL. You can post it to your own wall just to share it with others and let people know what you've watched today. Or you can share it with a friend if you think they might benefit from it. Thanks guys, I'll see you next week, bye.